God, we are not able to do the things that you can do. Too many times we try to take that into our own hands and we realize that we don't have the power, that you are almighty God and you have the power to help us in times when we're looking at a mountain and it just seems insurmountable. We look at the situation and say, there's no way we can make this happen. In reality, that's so true. But we look to you for strength and for guidance because you are able. You defeated death to give us life. And God, we're so thankful that you love us enough to do that. God, today we're going to be talking about families. And God, outside of you, our families have the most impact on our lives. So today is... is, is, uh, Pastor Todd comes and talks to us about families. I, I, I pray that you will open the hearts of everyone here, that they will, they will tune their ears and listen to how a godly family, how to make our families work as we honor you. God, Lord, in, in any circumstance that, that we've not had the greatest of families, Lord, we look to you as our Father. And so, Lord, we today just come praising you for being our Father with the example of families. Lord, today I pray for anyone in the church that is sick, that is having any type of financial struggles within their finances, marriage, or any other thing that they're struggling with. We know that life can be hard on us. But when we look to you for guidance, it seems we get a sense of peace and comfort of us as we go through life. Lord, I just come to you praying for this church as as we endeavor uh, looking for a, a pastor. I pray for the team that they look to you for guidance, that you will honor the worship that we put into this church and how we go about loving each other, how we go about picking each other up, Lord, that we just honor you in everything we do. Lord, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come together as a body and pick each other up, love each other as a family would because we're a church family. Lord, we thank you for that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I loved uh, the theme. It seemed like a theme anyway to me in the worship time this morning. It had to do with the resurrection. Uh, That is one of the number one reasons why the church gathers on a Sunday morning is because uh, Jesus is alive. And uh, if he wasn't alive, there wouldn't be a whole lot of reason to come together. That's our eternal life hope is because he lives, we also not only live now, but uh, death has lost its sting, its victory, and uh, there's always reason to celebrate that resurrection. Sunday morning is a great, great opportunity. So thanks for the worship time uh, and the focus on the resurrection of Jesus. If you ever feel hopeless or feel as though life is getting to you, remember the resurrection of Jesus, because this isn't all there is. Um, I want to quickly mention uh, a few announcements to you. Today at uh, 5 o'clock, the youth are gathering at Stars and Strikes. And so that means instead of dropping them off at the church here, you'll drop them off uh, over in Augusta at Stars and Strikes, and uh, pickup time is 8 o'clock. And so make sure you, uh, you remember that and uh, get your students there. Students, it's a great time to bring some friends with you, uh, this kind of event is. So make sure that you uh, invite some friends to come along with you. Also, uh, we just mentioned this week, the, the Bible study schedules that are happening uh, here at the church are on the, on the sheet, and you can look at that and uh, see exactly what uh, you need to be a part of, and we strongly encourage you to make sure you're in a Bible study. Uh, also, remember upcoming, we have uh, Pastor Chip will be here next Sunday, and if you remember, if you were here when he was here uh, last month, he's going to continue the series that he started 
Um, and uh, he's kind of marching his way through some aspects of the, of the Bible and, and, uh, and, and started in Genesis. And uh, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff. It always is. So make sure you're here for that next Sunday. Invite someone with you. Uh, we will be having communion upcoming and uh, potluck uh, Sunday lunch uh, upcoming, as well as new, newcomers class. Uh, in the in the future as well. So make sure there's a place in the back of the bu- little bulletin that you can sign up for any of those things or indicate any interest or any spiritual decisions you made. And so please uh, feel free to use that. And our tithe and offering box also serves as a communication form gathering place. So you can place that in that tithe and offering box. And uh, if you filled anything out on your sheet, also would uh, like to remind you that uh, your giving is uh, God honoring and it's deeply appreciated and it helps us to be able to do the things that uh, we ever endeavor to do here at the church. So you can give at the tithe and offering box or you can give online uh, through the app. And if you don't have the app, go to um, the website and it will guide you right to it. And uh, you can sign up for that and, and be a part of, of, of the giving family. So I want to uh, thank you again for being here. And uh, right now Tom has an announcement for you. Go ahead and uh, dismiss the middle school and the children's church. So good morning, everybody. So I met Todd Wilson over 15 years ago when Brenda and I went to our very first homeschool conference. And when we plan those things out, she always tells me which speakers she wanted me to go listen to. So I had no idea what I was getting into. When I went into this room, there was standing room only. And it was Todd Wilson's session. I've been hooked ever since. Todd Wilson is the real deal. He was a pastor before jumping faith headfirst into launching the family man ministry that he does now. And it has the mission to remind dads of what's most important. He's first and foremost a dad. He's a published author, a conference speaker, podcaster, game maker, master calendar publisher, and a global catchphrase author. From you the dad to that is so D and hashtag staying married, Todd and his wife Debbie and their eight kids have been pushing dads to be the best father and husband to lead their families in God's way. So let's give Todd a West Town welcome. Awesome. I was just li- listening, enjoying the whole thing. I sound a lot better when someone else is talking about me. Um, well, it is good being here. This is my first time down in West, West Town. West Town. Is that a town or is that the name of the church? Okay, so Augusta, right? In fact, I was looking because normally my family and I, uh, this is kind of early in our season, we travel around and we travel around in a big RV and we call the family man mobile and uh, I was going to look at my over my Rand McNally road atlas uh, because I keep track of all the Walmarts I've spent the night in and I was going to see if I've stayed in Augusta. I'm sure I have because as of right now, I'm at 296 unique Walmart stays. Uh, I, I know it sounds pathetic when you say it out loud. Uh, but uh, but it, it is an amazing thing. If you've never spent the night in a, in a Walmart, it's a good thing. Uh, and lots of space, and you get donuts in the morning. It's just a, it's a really good thing. In fact, my family and I, uh, we travel all over. Um, and it's changing a little bit, but uh, I know a lot of people come up to me afterwards when I talk about RVing and they'll say, oh, we should, you know, my, my wife and I, we've talked about getting an RV and we like travel the country. And I'm like, in my head, I'm always thinking, that's because you've fallen prey to those go RVing ads. 
you know, and they always look the same way, you know, fun. Uh, like there's a father and son, and they're like uh, this dark, starry night, and they're holding hands, and they're looking out into the dark stars, and in the background there's a little campfire with a, you know, you can smell the s'mores, and it says, go our being, you know, across the whole thing. That's nothing like uh, traveling around in an RV. Uh, my experience has been, uh, it, it should be a picture of the father and son looking out into the dark starry night, and in the background, the little camper should be on fire. Um, because that's been more of my experience. In fact, when we first started RVing, uh, we didn't know anything about RVing, but we got an old RV. Someone said, oh, you got to get a, you know, to travel the country and do what you're doing, go to church, church. And I'm like, okay. So we got one. And and we were living the life, you know, for that first week. And I remember we were down in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, speaking at this humongous church in a midweek kind of thing. And uh, when we were leaving the next morning, this, I mean, it was just a blue sky day. And my family were driving down the interstate, you know, in our new old RV, and it was old. And and I was just living the life. I thought, this is what man was created for, to be behind the wheel of a big rig, you know? And we're driving along, and I, and I just felt so overwhelmed. I, I know I, I sent up some kind of spontaneous prayer of thanksgiving to God, like, God, you're just so good to this dad. When all of a sudden, the whole RV just went, boom! And we, like, launched forward. I mean, I thought the back had exploded. I didn't know what was going on, and I'm like looking in my side mirrors. I don't see anything, and and so I kind of wobble over to the edge of the road, and and I get out and I see that a truck had slammed into the back of us, both going the same direction down the interstate. And this guy, the driver, he was young, and he must have been from California because he kind of had that dude sound, you know. And he walks towards me, and he's kind of staggering because he just ran into an RV. And I killed his truck. I mean, pieces of my RV are sticking out of the grill of his truck. And he stops about 20 feet in front of me, and he goes, man, I didn't see you. <laughs> I'm thinking, because you're blind? <laughs> you know, why is that? You know, and it was terrible. We had to be totaled out. Uh, uh, you know, my wife cried a lot. And we got home, and someone from our church said, hey, we know someone who owns an RV. Maybe they'll loan it to you. Just a little side note, if anybody ever offers you that, turn them down, you know, spit in their eye, walk away, don't do it. Um, because this ancient RV pulls in our driveway about a week later. It looked like a dinosaur, like it was ready to break in the middle. And we had to spend some money to fix it up. We went out to the East Coast, and uh, we were uh, going to see some friends we hadn't seen in a long time. And we pull into their big, long driveway, and then uh, I thought, my wife gets out to hug her friend, and, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I had to move the RV a little bit closer. I had already turned it off, but I went to turn the key, and it didn't make any noise. And I'm like, that's weird. I've, I hadn't done that before. And so I turned the key again, and instead of a broom, it went <laughs> I'm like, well, that sounded like a flame starting. And that's because now the RV was on fire. And so as it's crackling away, I'm outside screaming, the RV's on fire, you know, trying to find a fire extinguisher, which is not the time to look for one. <coughs> we put it out and uh, we disconnected everything so it was like a big car and we went back home, gave it back to the people who loaned it to us and the next year we started all over and got another old RV and we hit the road and again it was good and, and we had to go out to the uh, east coast again and we're traveling down the stretch of road and we'd had a freak snowstorm the night before, you all know what snow is right? And uh, <laughs> you've heard about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, we had this freak snowstorm. So, I mean, it was a beautiful night. And then the, the next morning, the snow was all melting away. And we're just driving down the road. And again, the sky is so blue, it hurts your eyes. And I, and I was just felt overwhelmed by God's goodness. And, and I even sent up that spontaneous prayer again, like, God, you are just so good to this dad. When out of the corner of my eye, I see this like turkey standing on the side of the road. And we see a lot of turkeys now, but we didn't see very many at the time. And, and I was about ready to say to my kids, oh, look, a turkey. When all of a sudden the thing launches off the ground like off an aircraft carrier, it goes, shoom, and then it goes, wham, right through our windshield. As in it's no longer outside our RV, but now it's inside our RV, and it's not dead. In fact, it sounds kind of funny as you're listening, but it was terrifying at the moment. 
You know, and it was like one of those old airplane movies where everything is moving in slow motion and it's just like, Whoa, you know, so I could, my, I could hear my wife screaming in slow motion. I could hear my kids screaming in slow motion. I could see the glass flying through the air in slow motion. I could hear my, the turkey going in slow motion, just flying around the inside. And I didn't know anything about turkeys except what I've seen on those outdoor shows, you know, that I guess they have a great big spur on the back of their leg. And all I could think was, he's gonna spur the kids, he's gonna spur the kids. But I couldn't stop because we were on this one of those long bridges where you can see the trees down below you. And so we're going across, the windshield's flapping, the, oh, the turkey's flapping, everything's flapping and flying and screaming. I finally get to the edge of the road, I pull over at the end and I, I'm corralling this turkey out of our RV and it kind of landed on the, the side of the road and uh, you know, it was not a happy moment and he probably never flew again. And I, in fact, I don't even know if you're an animal lover but I hope he died an agonizing death uh, because he was super expensive um, because we had to have a tow truck come and get us, a big one. And then we had to have another tow truck to get, to get our uh, trailer that we were hauling. And then we had to have another vehicle just to haul all my kids. And, uh, and they don't throw those in for free, you know? And so we're bouncing down the road. I'm sitting next to the tow truck driver and I've got a couple of my sons next to me and we're bouncing down the road. and. He looks over at one of my boys, and he's just a good old boy, and he goes, you guys ever riding a tow truck before? And one of my sons looks back at him and said, yeah, earlier this week. <laughs> so go RVing. Uh, it is a lot of fun, but it isn't easy. Kind of like family, right? It's a lot of fun, but it isn't easy. Just a little bit about my family, uh, just super brief. Uh, Tom already said I have eight kids, and uh, they're all growing up. Uh, in fact, we're expecting our ninth grandchild. Uh, my oldest son lives right next door, and uh, his kids and all the kids call me Pops. So that's pretty fun. I have another son who lives across the street, and uh, he married my daughter-in-law's sister. Uh, so now that makes him like my cousin. I don't know, something like that. It's confusing. Uh, her son-in-law, I'm not sure which, but and they have a child, and I have two more kids live about seven or eight minutes away, and they live across the street from each other, and they each have a couple kids, and it's an amazing, amazing thing, but it sure isn't easy, but it's worth it. But what I'd like to talk about this morning is because, you know, this is Valentine's weekend, right? Uh, or Valentine's week. Uh, husbands, I know you're good. You're good. You got it. Uh, somebody just sent me a picture of one of those uh, pictures of all the men at, you know, the Walmart uh, card section, usually at, at Valentine's Day. And it just looks like the sea of patheticness, <laughs> you know, where the guys are just grabbing any card they can find because there aren't any left. You know, dads, husbands, don't be part of that group, okay? Uh, because, you know, this is the week, this is the day coming up where we tell the people that we live with that we love them. You know, and I know, I used to think, I used to have not high expectations, I have higher expectations now, but I used to think that it was all about, you know, having a marriage that rocks. You know, in fact, I even talked about that 15 years ago. I don't talk about it anymore. I was listening on the radio on the way here, and there was a husband and wife, and I don't know who they were, and I'm not even sure they were Christians. But they were just, they're, they're, they were going to do a, uh, not a tour, they were doing a podcast, and they were doing something on Valentine's Day. And you could just tell that they're, they would be kind of a fun couple to come and listen to because they just disagreed about everything, you know? And you could just hear them just, she, he'd say something like, well, the, you know, we did this, and she'd go, well, that's not really exactly true, you know? And, and I, actually, I was having a little PTSD because it felt like my, my wife and I, uh, and, uh, and but, they, but they said, you know, we've been married 45 years, and you could tell they were committed to being married. You know, and they weren't saying it was about having a marriage that rocks. But it, I'll tell you what, I believe one of the reasons why we're struggling in our world right now is because, you know, they, they've challenged marriage, right? It's no longer between a husband and wife. Now it's between two husbands or two wives or maybe two wives and a squirrel. I don't know, it just doesn't matter anymore. Here's the deal. It used to be 
when somebody would stand up and go, you know, in our churches, well, Bob and Sharon have been married 55 years a day. Everybody would clap and go, yay. I'm wondering if our young people look at that and go, yuck. Because we don't always make it very attractive, do we? You know, we, we, we go to the, you know, we, that stereotypical, you go to McDonald's and you see a husband and wife and they sit across from, from each other and they never even speak to each other. You know, it's our job, I think, to make this thing that God gave us look good because it is good. Is it easy? Of course it's not easy. In fact, even when I talk about marriage, I know sometimes people come in and they think, oh, we're going to talk about marriage. I don't want to talk about marriage. It's gonna, you're just going to beat me up, you know, and it's going to... Let's just stop right now, okay? Because we're going to acknowledge that marriage is hard, right? It just is. Don't say, uh-huh, too loud. Uh, is your wife here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in another room, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Just uh, amen as loud as you want then. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it just is. In fact, I, I, I know, I can remember one time sitting in the back of the church. We were in the back, and I had my, wife, my arm around my wife. And my wife, she sees this guy up front with his arm around his wife. And she, said, she leans into me and she goes, they look so in love. And I said, I've got my arm around you. And she leaned back to me and she goes, that's different. <laughs> now, it looked exactly the same to me. I could not tell the difference. In fact, one time we got back from church and she said, did you see how David was stroking Pam's hair during the service? Pam had real long hair. And she said, it just looks so loving and tender like he was just cherishing her and of course I'm like I didn't see that <laughs> but the next Sunday during the sermon you know I thought oh yeah the hair thing and <laughs> so I go over to lovingly cherish my wife's hair and as soon as my fingers touch those little fringe hairs she goes don't touch my hair and I'm thinking how are we supposed to win this thing you know because my wife thinks that our marriage is the only one that stinks when the truth is, all our marriages stink from time to time. That's the truth, isn't it? Yes. Anybody who says otherwise is lying, or they're delusional, or they're not married, you know? Because it is hard. But here's what I found out. The hard things validate that it's good. You know, the easy things usually aren't that good. These hard things are good. And so we're going to look at a passage in the Bible, and we're going to do, play a little ping pong together. Um, we're going to look in 1 Peter chapter 3, and this is not my real Bible, because my real Bible is one that I lost, you know, that I, my wife gave to me when we got married, and I lost it. I was, like, devastated, and I prayed, and God brought it back. And I'm like, I'm not taking it anywhere ever again. So I got my fake Bible, but in my real Bible... My, my pa this passage is stained and marked up. And in fact, I've used it so much, I've looked at it so much, the, the pages come out of my Bible. Um, I just realized in my fake Bible, it's happened the same thing. And this page is, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to wad this page up and throw it away because it haunts me. Because, you know, there are a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about Oh, about how God takes care of himself, or not takes care of himself, but how God is holy and how God is just and, I, ju just, and I don't have to worry about those passages. But this one always faces me, you know, looks me in the eye and tells me, Todd, you need to be doing something a little differently. And so we're going to start reading it. We're going to do something different. We're going to read it backwards. Now, not word for word, because that would just be kind of weird. Um, but we're going to look in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, and we're only going to read the first couple words. And I'm going to ask you a question. It says this, Husbands, in the same way, stop, stop right there. What is that phrase, and this is not a trick question, what does that phrase, in the same way, mean? I'm asking. Just like. Just like. Like, we were talking about something, and now, husbands, like we were talking about, you know, do it like that, okay? So, we're not going to read right there. Uh, 
it's talking about the wives. It starts in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, wives, in the same way. So in that, that first part, the husbands, it points back to, the, to previously what we were talking about, the wives. Now it's doing the same thing. Wives, it's pointing back to the same thing we were just talking about. Now let's look at chapter 2, verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. It goes on, verse th chapter 3, verse 1. Wives in the same way. And then it talks about wives. Then it goes to husbands in the same way. What's he talking about when he's talking about marriage? I think he's comparing it to the sufferings of Christ. You know? It's not all Valentines. It's not all hugs and kisses. It's about some hard stuff. And so here's what we're going to do. We're just going to kind of go, and it's always weird when you see like yourself up on the screen from the back, you know? I mean, it's just distracting to me. I don't know why, but it is. Um, you kind of want to catch yourself, see if you're still doing it. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to talk about the husband's part uh, because it's always a lot of fun. I like to kind of get the wives in a good mood before we talk about them. Um, so we're going to start up there in chapter 3, verse 7. And I'm just going to read it. This is the NIV. Husbands, in the same way, be considered as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, and as heirs with the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers or will hinder your prayers. And my real Bible is the New American Standard. So I kind of switch back and forth where it says, husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. You know, and that's kind of a confusing word, in an understanding way. Um, you know, and, and really what it means is we're supposed to put their glasses on. You know, uh, my family owns a lake cottage, a family lake cottage, and and for the last, I don't know how many years, forever years, uh, we go up there. And I, we always have this pattern. My family would, would stay in this one bedroom. And I, when I go to bed, I take my glasses off and I sit them on the dresser. I did it last night at the chalet uh, at, their, at their house. And uh, I put my glasses there. And, and I kind of make it, when our kids were little, when my, uh, whenever my kids would get up, I would make it my responsibility to take care of them so that my wife could sleep because she had a hard day during the day. So I, I just kind of my, my responsibility. And as I was uh, sleeping, all of a sudden, one of my kids starts screaming. And so I stumble out of bed in the middle of the night, and I grab my glasses, and I stick them on my face. I realized right away that my, they were not my glasses. They were my wife's glasses. And I stuck them on my face. And, and then, are, are you ever doing something where you just have this profound thought? I had one of those profound thoughts. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this is how my wife sees things. So my kid's screaming in the background. And I'm just thinking, you know, with my wife's glasses on. And I thought, I wonder how she sees different things. And so as I thought about it, I thought, I wonder how she sees, you know, like uh, our kids. You know, where I see our kids just a lot of fun, and when they were little, you know, all, and I, viewing through her glasses, it was just like these monkeys who just make messes constantly, or constantly demanding from her. And then I thought, what about our house project? We were working on a house project at the time, and I, I loved it. I loved being, you know, where we had ripped off in this hundred-year-old house all the walls, all the ceilings, petrified mouse droppings were falling from the ceiling. You know, I loved it. And I thought, I wonder how she sees it. And I thought, and I looked, and it was just this big cloud that hung over her, that it wasn't over until it was all done. Then I had this terrifying thought. I wonder how she sees me. And there was this mirror right to the side of the dresser. And in my mind's eye, I kind of went like this, with her glasses on to see what she saw. And I saw me with five sets of arms and a big smile always being nice when I wanted something. You know, that's living with your wife in an understanding way. In fact, it involves some other things too. Um, and and I, I've, I've talked to wives and husbands lots, 
And in fact, in those things of understanding, there are some other things like loving and listening. And so I just like to talk about some of those just for a few minutes because our wife needs us to do some of these things. In fact, when I talk to wives, I ask them, I ask wives, what do, what do wives all want in a husband? And, I, and I'll let la ladies answer this. Ladies, what, do, what does every wife want in a husband? Be gracious when you say these. Act like you're thinking about them, not, and there are, you know, not from your marriage, you know? What are the things you think, uh, I'm asking? Conversation. Conversation. Ah, we're going to talk about that in just a second. What else? I know you're just being gracious. I won't, I won't pester you here. Um, but what I, what I find often is I hear this. We want a strong Christian leader. You know, our wives want us to lead. Husbands, living with your wife in an understanding way is part of leading. They want you to lead. Now, here's what I like to think of. I like to think of this uh, like a dog sled. I know you don't use them down here, uh, but, you know, um, I'm getting ready to go to Saskatchewan. I think they all ride on them up there. But, you know, you have the dog sled, you have the, the sled, you have the master, and then you have some dogs out front. And then at the very front, you have what kind of, what's the, that dog called? The lead dog. Yeah, I like how you say it down here, dog. Uh, you got the lead dog. I loved it. When I was looking at your church before I came down, I loved that. You, the first thing you kind of said was, we're casual. You know, you, if you want to dress ca I, I, and, and the warm weather, I thought about like wearing my NASCAR shirt with the sleeves cut off. You know, uh, I thought this would be awesome time to wear that. Um, but, you know, so you got the d d dog sled, and then you got the lead dog. You know, so the master gets up on the sled, and he cracks his whip, and they take off down the trail. After a little while, the, the master says, turn right. But the lead dog doesn't listen very well, so the lead dog turns left. And the master pulls the sled to a stop. He pats old doggies on the head. I should say, all the dogs have the same love, the same reward. They get the same meal. They get the love. The master loves them all equally. And he gets up to that lead dog and he shakes it. And he says, I told you to turn right. And he puts it in a spot. He gets back on the sled and he cracks his whip again. And off they go. Husbands, you're the lead dogs. You're the lead dog in your home. You know, that means you're responsible. So, what's your name, sir? Mike. Is this your wife right next to you? That could have been a little awkward right there. Uh, no, that worked out good. Um, and what's your name, ma'am? Kathy. Kathy. Okay, Kathy and Mike. So, Mike's the lead dog in his house. That means he's responsible. He's responsible for uh, everything, right? He is. You know, he's supposed to listen to the master. He's supposed to pull. So, and in other parts, it talks about, you know, how we're the head of our family. Um, so, Mike, if, if, if Kathy has some kids that, you know, she does this with, and I don't know if you do, but uh, <laughs> they do. Uh, we all do. You know, who's responsible to make sure that's right? The lead dog, Mike. You know, if... If Kathy doesn't feel loved, who's responsible to make sure she does? M Mike. You know, and I don't know about you, Mike, but sometimes I feel like that's a raw deal. You know, I get tired of being the one who's always responsible. My wife will say, well, I feel like our family's not very spiritual. And I'm like, well, can't you do something about it? You know, why do I always have to be? But I can't, can't get around that. I'm the lead dog, you know? You're responsible. Mike's responsible. By the way, if you're having trouble in your marriage this week, don't blame Mike. Well, I don't know, honey. He said it was Mike's fault. No, that's not the point. We're the lead dogs. So if there's, you know, I, I have husbands who will say, well, yeah, but my wife's being too hard on me. And I'm like, I don't doubt that. But you're the lead dog. You know, bring it on. We can take it. We said we would love, honor, and cherish. Remember that? I mean, I was just at a wedding last summer of a friend, and, you know, the weddings have just changed. Then in the old days, you know, when it used to be that they brought the bride and the groom up front, and the pastor said, do you so-and-so, and he'd say, I do, and she said, I do. But now everybody writes their own vows, and they just write them like, like poetry. And there was this, this husband, he 
he got he he was the one I went to this summer, and he's giving his vows, and he writes these, and he just goes on and on. When you're sick, I will be there. When you're throwing up in the toilet, I will be patting your back. You know, every wife in there was hating her own husband. I know I could feel my own wife going, "You're a loser, Todd." You know, <laughs> compared to this amazing guy. Well, we knew the the family, and three months later, we're talking to them. And the, the lady, the, the mom tells us that this couple that just got married, the guy who just read all that, you know, that they were not sleeping in the same room because her daughter snored and he couldn't stand it. And I'm like, I wanted to go and like beat him up, you know, and go, look what you read, you know, you're the lead dog. That's your job is to love your wife no matter what. You know, now here's the deal. You know, I talk about the lead dog, and I, tell, I told you that all ladies, you know, really, everybody, everybody, every lady says agreement. We want a strong leader. We want a strong Christian leader. You know, I finally figured out what you mean by that, ladies, that when you say you want that. I finally figured out what you want is someone to lead you in the direction you want to go, you know, because it's a lot of fun to lead in that direction, Right? It's a lot of fun to follow your lead dog when he's going right where you want him to go. I used to think I was smart before I got married. You know, I could do simple tasks all by myself. I could pull into any parking lot and find a parking space all by myself. You know, and then I got married and I am driving and I pull into a parking spot and this, my, and my wife goes, why are you parking here? And I'm like, You're doing it all <laughs> I said, is this a trick question? <laughs> you know, it's an empty spot. I thought the car would fit there, so I'm parking here. You know, and I got to the point where I would kind of freeze up when I'd pull into a parking spot. You know, I'd pull into the parking lot and I'd and I'd say, "Where do you want to park?" And she goes, "I don't care." And I'm like, "That's not true. You do care." In fact, one time I was talking to a group of ladies and I said, "Hey, when you come here when tomorrow, when you come to this event, tell your husband he did a good job parking the car." I said, don't go overboard like, wow, this is the best spot we've ever had. You know, we're not stupid, you know. And the next guy, day, this guy comes up to me. And he's got a suit on. And he's where, wherever you, he's from here because he sounds like he's from here. And he came up to me without a hint of a smile on his face. He said, I don't know what you told those women yesterday, but my wife told me I did a good job parking the car. And then he leaned into me, and he said to me, it'll never last. Now, guys, you don't get an answer. But ladies, why did he say, why did he say that? Because what she was say, or he was saying is, because I can never do anything right. You know, sometimes we husbands feel that way. We feel like we can never do anything right. So we don't lead. Do you know why we don't lead? Because we know it's going to be the wrong direction. So, ladies, here, husbands, you need to lead. You need to lead with a smile on your face. And ladies, you need to let the lead dog lead. Now, it's super simple. Let's not pick a really hard one. Let's just do an easy one. So, for example, um, so uh, I know that my wife, you know, when we have a room, you know, has a little chandelier and it's got four light bulbs in it. I'm the type who, when one burns out, I don't get to it right away. In fact, I probably let them all burn out and we just go to another room, you know. But every once in a while, I'll see those, it bugs my wife. And so I'll see her up on a chair changing a burned out light bulb. And I walk in, I'm like, I feel like she's crossed the line. Because everybody knows it's in the Bible that husbands are supposed to change the burned out light bulbs. I don't know exactly where, but I'm still looking. It's in there probably in the Proverbs, you know. And, and I feel like she's whatever. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? She goes, I was just changing the light bulb. And I said, well, I was going to do it. And she's like, when? I'm like, I don't know, but I was getting ready, you know. Um, you think I would appreciate her. Do you know what I feel instead? Resentment. Because, you know, she didn't say this, 
But when she's doing that thing that I feel like it's my job to lead in, I feel like she's saying out loud, you've let me down. Now, here's what we husbands do, all husbands do. Now look at me. We do this. We take a little step out. It's sometimes imperceivable, but we do. Ladies, I will guarantee you, I, can, I, I will guarantee you, you, this will work to get your husband more involved in your life, in your marriage, and in if your family. Here's what you do. Whenever you find yourself in a situation where all the burnt lights are burned out in the chandelier, what do you say? Nothing. You don't say anything. Here's what you say. Oh, we should have candlelit dinners, you know? And then when your husband finally says, oh, man, it is so dark in here. Look, I'm going to change the light bulbs. Where are they? And, you know, and he gets them and he replaces them. What do you say now? Thank you. That's all. You don't have to go, wow, it's about time. I didn't think you'd ever get there, you know? All you have to do is thank you. And he will do this. I guarantee it. Watch. He takes a little step in. It works on everything. I know some of you, if you have young families, you know, uh, we've been told that, you know, a good godly family will have family devotions. And husbands are supposed to lead family devotions. I'll tell you, that hangs over me. Because I'm not one of those dads who started, you know, the day, family devotions, the day his kids are born, and he stops the day they die, you know, move away or he dies. I'm the type of dad who maybe, we, you know, we skip a week or a year or two. Um, <laughs> but then we try it again, you know. And, you know, and the same thing with your husband. Your husband finally goes, oh, okay, I'll do it. And he didn't know what to do, so he's like, I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And, you know, he did the pledge. And then, you know, he knows you're supposed to sing a song, so he's like, dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh, and then he closes it with grace. You know what you're tempted to say, ladies? You're tempted to go, wow, that wasn't very spiritual. You know, Elizabeth Elliot, when they had family devotions, they had like two hours, and they sang great hymns of the faith by memory, and did great, you know. And you know what your husband thinks in his little head? Fine, then I won't ever do that again. It works in other things, too. You want your husbands to be more involved just in your life, you know, in doing things? You know, husbands, you know, we're the lead dogs, so there are times where we do things <coughs> just to lead, to help. You know, I know sometimes I'll see that stack of dirty dishes, you know, in the, uh, and, and nobody's taking care of them, and I'll open up the dishwasher, and I really haven't seen the inside of the dishwasher before, and I take some of these plates, and I stick them in there because I'm trying to be helpful, and all of a sudden, I put the plates right where the bowls go. And the world trembles. And my wife or wives will run in and go, oh, no, 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 you put them in the wrong place. No, if you do it this way, they won't, you know, they won't, you'll have to clean them again. They won't clean as well. You can't fit as many in, you know. What does your husband think then? Then do it yourself. I was just trying to help. You know, on a scale of zero being not important, 10 very important, how important is it how the dishes go in a dishwasher? I know some of you are struggling right now. Eight, maybe eight and a half? No, it doesn't matter. What if you have to do it twice? Who cares? You want your husband to be involved, to lead, then let him lead. Same thing with maybe, uh, again, young parents, if you have, you know, disciplining your children. All our wives want us to be more involved in disciplining our children. But here's what happens. We husbands, we see something that starts, to, and we just jump in with both guns blazing. You know, we don't even hear what's going on. Just We shoot everything. I don't care what you did. Just go to your room forever. You know, and you know what you moms do? You undo it. No, 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 no. Daddy didn't mean that. That was way too harsh, honey. You know, you were too hard on him. You didn't hear the whole situation. Here now, you go watch a video. Here's $10. You know, and... And then what does your husband think in his head? Fine, then I won't do that ever again. Husbands, you need to lead. You need to lead in your family. You know? You need to know, you need to listen to the master and pull. If your wife doesn't feel loved, it's your fault. I hate saying that because I've said it so many times that every once my wife reminds me. But it's true. You know, and then ladies, you let that lead dog lead. Is it scary? 
It doesn't have to be. Because, you know what? Here's the deal. Is it possible that God could use your knuckleheaded husband, and are we knuckleheads? Of course we are, <laughs> to get, us, get you exactly where he wants you to be, even if it's the wrong direction? Yes. He does it all the time. So let the lead dog lead. Husbands, in living with your wives in an understanding way, you need to listen to your wife. Listen. I mean, this is a huge thing. And husbands, you're doing an amazing job right now. You're looking at me, and I can tell you're listening. My son, Abraham, who's 22 now, but when he was little, he taught me all about listening. And I remember one time I was in the kitchen doing something, and I heard my wife at the computer, and she's a fast typer, so I could hear her fingers on the keyboard. And Abe came in, and he's like, Mom, Mom, Mom. And Abe's got these great qualities. He's loud, and he's persistent. And he's like, Mom, Mom. And my wife's like, what is it, Abraham? I'm listening. Mom, Mom, Mom. Abraham, I'm listening to you. Tell me which one. Mom, Mom, Mom. Abraham, just tell me. Mom, Mom. And I'm thinking, how long is this going to go on? And finally, I heard this. And that little boy didn't say, Mom, 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 one more time. Why is that? Because... He knew, without ever having a class on communication or reading a book on the fine arts of listening, that when someone is looking you in the eye, they're communicating. They're, they're listening to you. Husbands, your wife wants you to look, your, look her in the eyes and communicate. We're bonding here right now. <laughs> she wants you to communicate soul to soul. Husbands, when you're doing this, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Here, honey, I'm, I'm listening. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. You know? Or how about this? Yeah, I'll just mute it, honey. Go ahead and talk. Yeah. Oh, whoa, yeah. Or how about this? You're laying in bed. She's pouring out her heart to you, and you're going. <laughs> what does that communicate? Don't you dare say it's because you're tired. Because you're wide awake when you want to be wide awake. What does that communicate? You don't matter. You don't matter. You know, and, I, I, and I'll be honest, I hope this doesn't sound harsh, ladies, but some of the things you talk about, we don't care about. <laughs> you know, I mean, my wife, I remember when we were first married, and we're, we're getting ready for church, and, and we're getting dressed, and then she comes out of the closet, and she's got, I mean, she didn't come out of the closet right then. That would have been a really bad Sunday. Uh, <laughs> but she steps out of the closet, it just works awkward, any way you say that. And, she, and she, she hikes up her pants, and she goes, Todd, which socks do you like better, the ones on the right or the ones on the left? And I said, who cares, honey? Nobody's going to be looking at your socks. What does it even matter? I knew right away that was the wrong answer because this icy chill came into the room. And because what my wife heard was not that I didn't care about her socks, but that I didn't care about her, you know? And so a couple months later, she does the very same thing. She hikes up her pants. Todd, which socks do you like better, the ones on the right or the ones on the left? And I said, the ones on the right. She goes, you didn't even think about it. And I said, because who cares? <laughs> Nobody's going to be looking at your socks. What does it matter? <laughs> same icy chill. <laughs> you know? You know, husbands, your wife wants you to listen, to really, really listen. I was at a, uh, on a bus at Disney World, and... Uh, I was sitting like on the aisle and there was an, I mean, there's an aisle right here and there was a guy, I could almost touch his shoulder. And he was sitting next to his wife and his wife was talking about how she was having a bridal shower or a baby shower or some kind of shower. And she was just talking through all the food items she was going to make. I mean, she went on for 15 minutes. She's like, I'm thinking about doing the ham sandwiches on the wheat bread and I'm going to do the, you know, turkey sandwiches on the white bread. And I'm thinking about, you know, with the little double eggs, the little, and he just sat there the whole time with his arms crossed going, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After about 10 minutes, I almost went, ma'am, he doesn't care. <laughs> you know? But he was a better husband than I was. Because what was he showing his wife? That he cared about her. Husbands, sometimes we are so busy that we show our wives that we don't care. And this is one that I hear from my wife. You know, and here's the deal. When we're driving around in our RV... I mean, I'm sitting there. We average about 1,000 miles a week. And so I would sit there, and she sits right next to me. But after about a week and a half, she's, she'll say to me, I don't feel like we've talked. And I'm like, man, I feel like we talk all the time. She goes, yeah, but we, ha we don't talk. 
I said, well, it feels like talking, <laughs> you know. I'm talking, you're talking. I don't. She goes, and then I heard on the radio, I don't know what the program was, Focus on the Family, maybe, I don't know. And it was this lady, she goes, I just want my husband to understand that I want the conversation not to be while we're going somewhere. I want it to be the destination. You know, what she was saying is that she didn't want us just to talk while we're doing things. She wants us to go somewhere and talk and really talk. Because when my wife talks and feels listened to, she feels loved. Husband, your wife feels the same way. She just wants you to listen. Now, here's the deal, ladies. So finally, you know, my wife comes out of her closet and she's got, she hikes up her pants. She says, so which socks do you like better, the ones on the right or the ones on the left? And I go, hmm, can you turn around? <laughs> then I think, and I say, you know, I think you should wear the ones on the right. Now, only men can answer. Husbands, which ones does she wear? In one, neither. And she picks a third pair. Well, that does ruin my illustration, but, so we're going to ignore yours right now. In one voice, they cry out the ones on the left. I think that is so interesting. So can you understand, ladies, how when you say to your husband, I don't know, I just feel my heart is so heavy about this one kid or this other situation, I just don't know what to do. And he says to you, I don't know, honey, anything you want to do is okay with me. Do you like that answer, ladies? You hate that answer. Do you know why you get that answer? Because he knows that whatever he answers, you're going to do something else. So he thinks, what's the point? What's the point? And again, I'm not pointing out certain people. This is all of us. This is all of us. But this is the part. You know, we didn't read the passages in 1 Peter chapter 3, but that's what it says. You know, we always get hung up on this. You know, wives in the same way, submit yourselves to your own. We're all so concerned about that word submitting. But that's what it is. You just let the lead dog lead. And that's what you want. You know, that's what husbands want. And so, here's the deal. We're just about out of time. You know, this is such a big, big deal. You know, and I didn't even really cover this, but, but you know, in that loving your your wives, you know, what kind of love is that, husbands? We call that a certain kind of love. Sacrificial love. You know, unconditional love. You know, I know that, that love means the most because I RV. And one of the things about RVing is that you, you never want to run out of propane because propane is what keeps your RV warm, you know, when it's cold. And I remember one time we were in the exotic destination of like Peoria, Illinois, and uh, we were staying at a Walmart downtown. It was spring, early spring, late winter, and uh, it was cold, and we were low on propane. And as, as we were uh, getting ready for the, you know, going to sleep, I told my wife, I said, you know, we're pretty low on propane, but I think we're gonna be okay. We'll get some in the morning. Halfway through the night, I knew I was wrong. <laughs> because I could hear the furnace kick on, the blowers, and all that came out was cold air. And I'm like, uh. Now, you know, they make the walls of an RV about the thickness of a styrofoam cup. Uh, so it was cold. And my wife goes, do you think we should give our kids you know, some of our comforters. We had like three comforters on us. My kid, other kids, are, they had one blanket, and I can still see my one son kind of balled up like an armadillo, just trying to conserve heat only in his Superman underwear. And she goes, do you think we should give him uh, some of our blankets? And I said, no, uh, they're fine, they're fine. And so about an hour goes by, and, and it's getting colder. And she goes, Todd, we got to give the kids blankets. I was like, honey, they're fine. You know, if they were cold, they'd be awake. They're not awake, so they're not cold. It's perfect logic, you know? And she goes, well, at least give the girls, Maggie and Catherine, they were like on this uh, little dinette together. At least give the girls one of the blankets. And I'm like, honey, no. About an hour later, she finally convinces me. And so I 
reluctantly put my my blanket on them. And I, one of the great things about parking in a Walmart parking lot is that if you need a space heater in the middle of the night, you can go get one. If you need a trampoline, you can get one of those too. So I go in and get a uh, space heater, think I'm going to turn on the generator, plug it in, start warming things up. As I'm unpacking this thing, Catherine wakes up and she sees my comforter laying on her. And she says, Dad, you gave me your comforter. And I said, yeah. I didn't want to. No, I didn't say that part. <laughs> yeah, I did. And she said, Dad, were you cold because you gave me your comforter? And I said, no, I was fine. And as I was unpacking this thing, I could, I could hear the wheels in her head turning. And then she said, about three minutes later, she goes, Dad, I know you were cold because you gave me your comforter. And I could feel the love coming out of that little girl and wrapping itself around me like a dozen comforters. You know, husbands, my daughter loved her daddy because of his sacrifice. It wasn't very noble. <laughs> She didn't know that part. You know, guys, our wives would kill for you to sacrifice for your, for your wife. For maybe you not do your thing on Saturday morning. Or maybe not go fishing or hunting or whatever you do here. <laughs> I don't know what to do run guns, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, or whatever. Or maybe not take the promotion that's going to mean travel. Or not take this job, which means pulling our... You know, they just want us to sacrifice for them. And we said we would. We said we would. And so, uh, in the last couple minutes, let me just say... Here's the deal about this, and you can go back and read it and maybe make this your study for the week. It says this in the guy section, live with your wives in an understanding way, treat them as heirs, and then it goes on and says, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. You know, I cannot find another verse mentioned in the whole Bible about a specific sin that is said to hinder our prayers, except that one right there. So if Mike comes up to me afterwards and says, hey, Todd, would you just pray for me and Kathy? Because we're just kind of eh lately. I said, oh, yeah, sure, I will. Yeah. If I'm not living with my wife in an understanding way back in Milford, Indiana, somehow that prayer is hindered. I don't understand all that that means, but it's not good. And so I'm letting down Mike. I'm letting down Kathy. I'm letting down their kids, their future kids their future kids, kids, because I'm not living with my wife in an understanding way. Husbands, if we want to change the world, it will not be because you find the world's best pastor to replace you. You know, it will not be because you have a great program here at the church. It will be because just a few of us are living with our wives in an understanding way. And then we go to God in prayer. Last comment. Um, before I give you the, my little commercial, um, is that I just want to encourage you to stay married. Now, you may be married four or five times. I'm not talking about the past. I'm talking about right now. If you are married, stay married. I mean, people will say to me, well, well should we just stay married for our kids? I'm like, yes! And stay married for your kids' kids. And your kids' 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 kids. You know, I don't know. We can't change what the world is doing because it's getting crazy. But we can stay married. Um, we used to have some T-shirts. Uh, Tom mentioned those. Uh, we've got some window decals. If you'd like, they're five bucks out at our table. Um, if you want a staying married decal, you can get one of those. But I'll tell you, it is so huge. It is so huge. And I know it's hard. But you will reap a reward if you don't grow weary and stop. That's a promise. Hey, thanks for allowing me to be here. I've got some stuff out on a table out there. And I always struggle a little bit, you know, about selling things on a Sunday in a church. But I've worked through it, so I'm good. Uh, so i got some stuff out there to sell. Uh, <laughs> um, so now that we've cleared that, um, just some things out there to encourage you. I mentioned those window decals. 
Um, some things for dads or granddads. Uh, uh, these are little wooden nickels uh, that, that we have for just that say you to dad on one side, on the other side it says an hour of dad time. If you need a little tool to nudge you to do things with your kids, um, this is the tool. You know, it's just a gentle reminder. Um, we've got some other books out there uh, for you dads. One's called uh, Dad Power. Uh, it's written for the busy dad just to remind you again of the most important thing you're ever going to do. Super simple. It's a lot of fun to read. Along with that, uh, the 365 Day Dad, it's just a page a day. I know it's kind of thick, um, so we don't even call it a book um, because we know dads don't like thick books. Um, we don't call it a devotional because we know dads don't like devotionals. But if you just need a daily encouragement, check out this brightly colored rectangle. Uh, <laughs> And then just a couple more. Uh, one is yesterday when I stopped on the way here, uh, I stopped at a, uh, I don't know, fast food McDonald's. And uh, I was standing in line and there was a dad, he came in and he had two kids and, and both of his kids were on iPads at the counter. They were each playing their game. That's not, it's not evil, but they're being swept away. You know, here's my fear. My fear is that we're gonna take these Hard relationships, is it hard being married? Yes. Is it hard being a parent? Yes. Then we're going to take these hard relationships and exchange them for virtual ones that are easy. Are those relationships, it's like going to Candyland when you go on social media, you know? But hard relationships are good. Easy ones aren't good. So we wrote this little book called Taming the Techno Beast. If you just need some encouragement to, to help your kids or grandkids to maybe say no to some of that stuff because and maybe even to check your own life um, to see if maybe you're being swept away by technology because we are right I mean I have husbands who say to me all the time oh yeah my wife she calls my phone my mistress you know a, a pastor's wife came a pastor came up to me and said yeah he goes I was looking for my phone the other night and I asked my wife where's my phone and she said, oh, I, I put that on your pillow so you could tuck that into bed tonight. And I've had husbands come to me and say, you know, can you say something to my wife? Because every time I say something, she gets defensive. And of course, I don't say things to their wives. <laughs> yeah, bring her up here. I'll talk to her. No. Um, and then this little book here, it's called Family is Hard. Deal with it. You know, uh, there's always uh, lots of books that sell lots of copies that tell you how to make marriage easier and life easier and family easier. I don't think it's tr it can happen. People come up to me and say, I must be doing something wrong because our marriage is so hard. And I'm like, I don't think you're doing something wrong necessarily. You are doing something good. And good things are always hard. So uh, if you need some encouragement in that, check that out. Um, and then two other things. I've got some dad hats if you're into hats. Uh, and you all are, uh, because you're from here. Uh, so if you want a hat that says family man or uh, this fan man, um, they are the best hats that I have ever found. And I've looked at lots of hats. And if you, I mean, not, I'm not kidding, Dad. Dad, if you just pick one up, it's like holding a newborn baby. Uh, so check out those hats. And then lastly, I brought some. I know we're a long way from Christmas. We just had Christmas. Um, but we have some Christmas games. Uh, Tom mentioned in this game. I think, did you mention a game? Game Master. I don't know about a Game Master, but this is a no-skill game. I don't like games. I figured there's a reason they're called board games. Uh, but, uh, but if you just want a, a but I, if you want a family interaction game, this is the game for you. You know, you just roll your dice, you move your mice, and you try to get to Bethlehem. Um, you do some silly things along the way, you interact. Honestly, I played it a million times. I don't think I could play it one more time. And we play it every Christmas. My family has an amazing time. Um, they're just under 30 bucks, but here's a super sweet deal. You don't live far away from me, but the shipping, if you buy it online, is super expensive. I cannot do it cheaply. So you don't have to pay any shipping, so that's a good deal. I don't have tons of them, but I have some. So we got some things out there. Please sign up for our, our weekly email. We have a podcast to, called The Family Man Show. Uh, if you're interested in that. Um, we've got some other products out there. If you know any homeschoolers or you are a homeschooler, um, as well. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, let me pray for you before I let you go. Actually, I'm going to give it back to Tom after this. Father, we just acknowledge that it's hard being married. But we know you set it up that way. And maybe if it had been two men, maybe it would be easier. But this is better. And we thank you for making it so. 
And I just pray, Father, I pray for the husbands, that you would help us to be the lead dogs, and that we would just lead and pull and listen to you. And I pray for the wives, that you would give them the strength and the courage to let the lead dog lead, just to show them that it works. And we just come before you knowing that we got a lot of work to do. Let it just begin as we go out these doors. We pray all this in your name. And I pray a special blessing on this church as they're looking for a new pastor. Um, would you make their path straight and bring in the right person? And let this church continue to shine. In your name we pray. And all the husbands and all the wives said, Amen. 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 So, uh, yeah, Todd, thank you so much. Um, it just reminds me why I got hooked on that first time I saw you. Um, but we got a little something for you, um, just as a thank you for coming, and uh, I'll just leave it over here. But um, I'll give you time to get out if you want to go to the table and, um, and do that. But the crosses are open if you guys, uh, you know, need prayer, uh, if something hit you between the eyes and between the uh, chest plate, please uh, go talk to these folks and, uh, and talk to God about it. But uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, listening to Todd. And uh, please stop at his table. Uh, he's got lots of materials and it will bless your heart. God bless you. You're dismissed.